Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Intrepid Museum's new live virtual programming. We are so happy that you're joining us today. I can tell you where I am here in New York City. It's very rainy and it's a great day to sit and just listen to some interesting information about Intrepid. So we're so happy that you've joined us today. Um, our live streams are free here at the museum. And if you'd like to support us in delivering all of this exciting content, please click on the link, link below in the description. So my name is Jessica Williams. I'm the curator of history here at the museum and I'm gonna be your host today. And um, I love talking about the museum's collections. Of course, we have so many wonderful things here that we collect. And I was thinking today about what would be a fun thing to talk about. And um, I, you know, again, because it's really rainy, unpleasant here in New York, it made me think about wanting to go somewhere else to imagine, you know, going on vacation, which is something I'm sure many of us wish we could be doing in this pandemic, but can't. And it made me think about um, in places that Intrepid went. So today we are going to talk about ports of call on Intrepid, um, why the ship traveled places, where the ship went, and some of the souvenirs that our crew members brought home with them. And one thing I will say is, you know, we're going to cover a lot of ground. This is a rich topic. We have so many things. And we're focusing on these different places. Um, a little bit later on, we'll get into some of the more adult activities that uh, crew members were doing, not in any great detail, but just to be aware, there may be some bars, drinking, other things like that later on in this programming, um, just so, just in case there's younger audiences, it's good to, good to know. Um, so let's take a look at the first introductory image we have here. Um, and, you know, many of you have probably heard the Navy recruiting slogan, um, join the Navy and see the world. Um, and this idea of joining the Navy and going to all these different parts of the world was and is a major draw for people to choose the Navy instead of perhaps joining another branch of the US military. So um, what we're looking at here is a souvenir map that I really love that one of our crew members donated to us. In fact, I think we have two different ones in the collections from two different people. And it says the Mediterranean cruise. It shows this colorful map of the Mediterranean, different flags and places. And in the corner, it um, has the crew member's name. Um, this crew member's name is Tom Borgo, and it says that Tom was a member of the ship's crew, and this is a souvenir of the many places that he went. So I think this is a great starting point image just to think about Intrepid and Intrepid's travels. Before I get too deep into that, though, I always want to talk again a little bit about um, our collections and where they come from. And I say again, because if any in the past, you've heard me talk about this a little bit, but most of our collection comes from donations from former crew members and their families. And we store all these things on board the ship in our collection storage space. So that is the image that you're looking at right here. This is a part of the ship that is climate controlled. So all the artifacts stay at a happy temperature. So they'll last for a very long time. Um, different types of items are stored in different places around this room. So we store all the photos together. We store all the helmets together. Um, souvenirs and things live together. Um, uniforms and fabrics and things live together. So we keep everything in a place where um, everything is going to um, going to last and be safe and be preserved for future generations to be able to look at. We have a lot of items associated with ports of call. And I think for people who served on the ship, buying souvenirs of all these wonderful places they went was a really um, big deal. And it was important to them to, to preserve those things going forward. So ports of call is a really big topic. And we have a lot of items associated with um, all of the places that Intrepid went. So it's good to, again, remind ourselves to take a look at it. Intrepid. Again, I'm not on Intrepid today, but this is a um, nice image of Intrepid. Um, the ship is anchored out here in Greece at the time this picture was taken in the late 1950s. So you see a good side view of the ship here. Um, we see the ocean, we see some mountains in the background or you know, in a bay probably. And then we see a little corner of a small boat that I'll talk about what that is in a minute. But I think you know before we get into the places Intrepid went, it's really important to talk about why visiting ports of calls was so important for Intrepid and for the crew. So we're gonna look at a picture now taken on board the ship. And this is a picture of the flight deck on board Intrepid. And we see a few guys standing around this S2 airplane here um, after just having landed. And just to imagine ourselves on Intrepid, right? Working on board an aircraft carrier at sea is hard work. The days could be long, especially if um, the ship was in combat, right? Launching, um, flight operations, different missions. These guys could be working here on the flight deck for 16 hours a day. 
There's all people below decks doing all sorts of things from cooking food all day, doing laundry all day, steering the ship, taking care of different pieces of equipment, repairing aircraft, all of this. It was a really, really, could be a really, really tough, tough job. And when the ship was out at sea, its deployments would be around maybe six, seven, eight months, depending on what was happening. So crew members were separated from their families for a really long time. And it really took an emotional toll on people being away from home for such a long time, especially because many of the crew members were fairly young, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old, maybe joining the Navy was the first time they spent any extended time away from home. So people felt homesick. And all of these things, you know, the, the, the commanding officer of the ship was always really concerned about morale on board, making sure that everybody is ready to um, safely and correctly do whatever needed to be done to, to operate the ship and to do whatever missions the ship was involved in at a given time. So, you know, the Navy, the, the, they provide a lot of entertainments on board the ship, different um, performers would come and visit, there, were, there was athletic equipment, there were sports teams, there was a library, there were all these things to try to um, pass the time. Um, but it still could get very tedious. And when Intrepid was going on its, you know, starting its journeys places, these guys could be on board the ship for 10 days before they stop somewhere. So going out to go visit ports was a really, really important part of helping the crew, you know, really appreciate um, uh, or to, to have good morale and to enjoy their time in the Navy and get a break from all of the, all of the work that they were doing. So let us see here. Um, so, oh, I, I, yes, we are looking again at our picture of Intrepid because I want to point something else out about this picture to you. And the question is, to answer the question, how did these guys get into port? What were the ways that that happened? Now, in a lot of ports, Intrepid could actually pull up to a pier and um, and the crew members could just get off on the pier and go, go off uh, and explore. But in some cases, they couldn't do that. The ship was too big, and there was no pier that was large enough for the ship to um, to 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 tie up. So um, they used these small boats. And again, we see the oops, I shouldn't do that because then it makes all those things come up. But in the corner, um, you can see that that this boat. So this photo is being taken from somebody in one of these little boats, and I can show you um, in these pictures how people actually got off the ship. So this is on the left is a zoom in of the picture I just showed you. And there's a yellow arrow pointing to what looks like a little diagonal ladder. Um, and that is if you look on the right, you can see the crew members going down the ladder um, into this little boat. So crew members are able to get off and go to ride these little Liberty launches, these small boats to go and explore different ports of call. So, um, oh, and that's a close up view of one of those boats. It says Intrepid 3. There were a number of these boats that were stored on board the ship. And you can see Intrepid in the background here. Uh, and these crew members are all headed off to, um, to go explore the sites here. We're not sure, I'm not sure exactly when this photo was taken. We don't have a date on it. So I don't know where they're headed, um, but probably somewhere in the Mediterranean and hopefully somewhere fun and warm. So I wanna talk a little bit about, uh, before we look at this picture, just about some of the other some of the, th the jobs that the crew were doing when they would go visit ports of call. So again, a lot of the time, you know, crew members are really looking forward to just exploring and we'll talk about that in a minute, but the Navy also had some important reasons why the Navy had ships go on these port visits and had crew members leave the ship and go out into these local communities, wherever the ship was operating because um, visiting ports of our allies helps the Navy build relationships, right? Build relationships with other governments, build relationships with the citizens of other places. It's showing a friendly face really to put it in a simple way. Um, these kinds of activities going into port and doing different things in port were especially important during the Cold War, during Intrepid's um, you know, major period of service because um, this was a way of showing um, you know, countries in the Mediterranean, in the North Atlantic, that the United States is a powerful ally with this giant aircraft carrier, right? They're pulling right up into these cities. Um, the Navy would often open the ship to public tours so people could go on board and see, um, you know, see the ship and walk around and talk to sailors. These are really goodwill activities. The U.S. is a friendly and a powerful ally. And by going into ports, it's a way of trying to make these kinds of connections. So to look at a few of these sorts of activities Intrepid was doing, here, I'll get this, these guys a little bigger here. Um, this is a photo taken on board Intrepid in the late 50s. And so these um, children are a group of Greek 
orphans who came on board for a tour of the ship. And so, um, and so you can see them sitting here. They would often get a snack, even some ice cream or having something to drink, and they would get a tour, maybe watch some cartoons and get a chance to, to um, explore the ship and meet some sailors and just, you know, have a nice, a nice day out. So you can see all these children here. Another thing that the ship did during this time period was that the crew members on the ship sponsored a child from Greece. Um, he's a boy. And uh, and they sponsored him through one of those sponsor a child type charitable organizations. So crew members chipped in to um, raise funds to give to this to this kid that he and his family could use for his schooling, for food, for really anything that they needed to support the family. So this was a way that you know not every crew member, of course, is going to chat with kids who are visiting, but this is a way that crew members who wanted to could um, could give something back to, in this case of this community community in Greece. So that's one sort of thing that they would do as a goodwill activity. Um, and here is another one. So it's in the center of this image, it's a very crowded image. There's a lot of people. You see some umbrellas. There are some um, signs in the back because this is inside uh, or in a town right on the street. And in the center of this image wearing a white is um, the ship's commanding officer at this time, Vincent Kelly. And this is a picture taken in the Philippines during one of the ship's deployments during the Vietnam War. So um, when Intrepid was fighting in the Vietnam War, the ship would be um, would be engaged in combat operations. So its aviators would be launching attacks against um, targets in North Vietnam for a period of about 30 days or so. And then the ship would go into a port and the crew members would have opportunity to go on liberty and kick back a little bit. So this is one a port visit in the Philippines. And um, this was associated with um, a Navy program called Operation Hand Clasp um, is what it was called at the time. I think it's Project Hand Clasp now. But the idea was that um, uh, the Navy was providing um, donations and other sorts of support to local communities. So during this particular visit, this is July of 1968, the commanding officer of Intrepid visited four different villages in the Philippines and crew members donated supplies, things like food, medical supplies, and other things to those communities to, um, to help the people there. So that's one. Um, we can take a look at another thing that they did. This is a excerpt from one of the ship's plans of the day. And this is about crew members donating blood. Um, again, this one is from Greece. And uh, this was 1961. And so 800 members of the ship's crew donated blood during this port visit, uh, which is a fairly big percentage of a crew. There are about 3,000 people on board the ship at that time. So 800 of them. It's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty good, um, a good number. And this snippet here is showing the percentage of each department that um, participated in the blood drive. And one thing it notes here is that the, um, the Marine detachment every single one of the ship's Marines donated blood. So they get an extra you know, round of applause. And then some of these other departments is calling out the percentage as a way of trying to encourage more people to, um, to represent their department and um, give blood in these places. And then the last thing related to just the kind of goodwill activities is that Intrepid had a band. Um, there were also sports teams on the ship and the band and the teams would often go out and perform or play in different places that the ship visited. So this is a flyer from um, from a port visit to Livorno in Italy and Intrepid's band was performing a concert um, during, this, during this port visit. So again, another way to connect with local people, to introduce people to the Navy uh, and all of that. So all these different things are ways that crew members are trying to um, support the Navy mission and goodwill and um, you know really good feelings about the United States during these port visits. But um, of course, a lot of the times um, crew members really just were excited to get out, go to these places, explore. These are three guys. This is, we think this is taken in Japan. Um, one sailor has his camera and ready to go out and, um, and see the sights. Again, this is a really exciting thing for many crew members at the time. Here we have a map, and this is probably hard to see. I'll show you a detail of it on the next slide. But this is a map of Intrepid's Mediterranean cruise from 1959. And there's all these little cartoons here of the places that the crew is going to go. And in this case, this kind of map is really highlighting the excitement of travel 
the excitement of going to these places um, and less about the ship's mission. It's really about all the things that crew members will have a chance to enjoy in these different ports. Here's a detail um, of the of this map here. So we have a sailor clinking a beer stein with somebody in Germany. We have a can-can dancer and the Eiffel Tower representing Paris. There is next to the word France, there is a sailor on a train headed off. Um, the word Switzerland is down there. And there are all these little different funny cartoons associated with all of these different um, different places that the ship was going. So um, we have a number of these maps from different times on board, also some where crew members were uh, draw, where they would draw in themselves ports of call and tra trace the ship's path so that they had it as a souvenir of their visit. Now, one thing to note here, we'll look at those more in a sec. Um, one thing to note is that, you know, we think about travel, right? And I think, you know, looking back at Intrepid Service from here we are in 2021, and of course, none of us are going anywhere really at the moment, but Americans travel more now than they did back then. And so for the vast, vast majority of people who served on Intrepid, they really hadn't done any international travel before joining the Navy. So of course, some crew members may have done, visited some ports on previous deployments. But most people, you know, if you imagine yourself when you're 18 or 19 and you are um, joining the Navy from any town in the United States, some people had never even seen the ocean, never even seen an aircraft carrier, let alone um, uh, left the United States. So crew members needed some information about what to do when they were traveling. And many of them, you know, they're, they're very enthusiastic. They have each other. They're organized tours and things. But to actually equip crew members to, um, to travel internationally, the ship and the Navy provided information to make it possible for these guys to um, to enjoy their time in port. So what we're looking at here, and I'll make them bigger again, um, are covers from what we call port of call booklets. And these were all printed on board Intrepid. Intrepid had a print shop on board. It's a super cool space. It's one that's not open to the public right now, but it's really interesting. And maybe someday in a future program, um, I could take you down inside to that, that space because it's really cool. And it's a, it's an, a um, they were still using the little movable type and all of that to print things on board the ship. So it's it's um it's also a glimpse at some technology that most people really aren't using anymore. But anyway, um, uh, so the um, uh, crew members would print these port of call booklets and distribute them to the crew before the ship um, visited these different places. So these are three different booklets here. Um, and they, each one looks really different because they usually had the crew member with some artistic talent create uh, the cover illustration. So there is one from Germany, one from Genoa, Italy, and one from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And each one of these booklets provide information for the crew about what to do in these different ports. They could include anything from the history of the city they're visiting, some of the key sites to see, uh, information about currency exchange rates and things like that, common souvenirs that people might want to buy or food that people might want to try. There's often some language guides, so some key phrases so that you can speak the language in these places. And let's see, um, maps often. There's a sort of a map of the port area and sort of key places to go. Some of them have tips about how to be polite, sort of proper etiquette for different countries. And also some of them include places to avoid. Um, there were sometimes areas of these cities where sailors were forbidden to go, usually because they were full of bars and you know, disorderly, you know, potential for disorderly behavior. So they would also advise you where not to go. There might be information about where the USO is in that particular city. So there's a lot of um, info here. And it's also worth noting, I realized that I did not mention at the beginning, sort of where Intrepid traveled. Um, during World War II, Intrepid went to the Pacific. They really weren't going on port of call visits so much at that point, but starting in the 50s, um, the ship was mostly deployed to the Mediterranean, also to the North Atlantic, went on some um, uh, exercises or other things in the Caribbean, uh, stopped um, some ports in Canada. Um, during the Vietnam deployments, uh, depending on which way the ship was going, sometimes the ship went through the Suez Canal, other cases went down around Africa to get to the Gulf of Tonkin, came back around um, uh, 
uh, back around South America. And uh, so the, the Intrepid really covered a lot of ground. So there are a lot of different ports in different places. Oh, went to Australia and New Zealand on one of the Vietnam deployments. Um, yeah, and I see, you know, seeing some comments from some, some of our friends here on the stream. Uh, I see a note here from Larry who mentions that um, he was on Intrepid and has some photos from one of the med cruises in the 1970s. So, you know, there was, um, the ship really went around. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Larry. It's great. Um, you know, we love, uh, love all, of the, all of the images of crew members out in these, these places. So the, so the ship really went a lot of places and depending on when a crew member served, you know, they could have gone and visited many, many different places. But these booklets are a way of helping helping guys figure out what to do on the ground in these places. So we're gonna look at four different things in the collection that are souvenirs that crew members brought back. Um, and we have a whole range of different things that crew members brought. Some of them were souvenirs for themselves. Some of them were souvenirs for their families. Um, just, you know, interesting things that people brought back in port. You may hear a very loud siren going by here in a minute. It's the uh, it's the ambiance of the of the wonderful um, uh, online presentation. Anyway, so this is a uh, a great photo of a um, of a trip to the Acropolis that um, Intrepid's crew did in the either late fifties or early nineteen sixties, and the ship would organize these group excursions. So if people all wanted to go together to see something, you could, you know, join on or, you know, pay a little bit to go on a tour. So this is, um, this is the Acropolis. So here are all these sailors. There's a few officers here as well, standing, uh, standing or sitting there. And if we look at what we have here, this is a souvenir um, from Greece that a crew member brought back. Uh, this is a scarf. And you still see these sorts of things when you visit different countries, often, you know, printed with different sites associated with whatever, um, whatever country you're visiting. So this is a nice bright red one, and it is printed with places in Greece. So here is a detail from it. So this is the, this is Acropol, it's the Acropolis there, and you can see, um, see this detail image. So we have a number of these from different places that crew members brought back. Um, the nice thing, you know, often people were bringing it back for a relative. Um, the nice thing about these is they're fairly small and compact, so somebody could fold it up, easily, easily store it to take it, take it back with them. So that's a fun one. Another thing we have, um, you know, there are some. It's funny that we, when we look at things in the collection, there are certain sites that we have a lot, lot of photographs of, of crew members visiting, and it's because often both the fact that the ship stopped in this place a number of times and because it was something that was impressive and that a lot of crew members wanted to see. And so um, this is the Great Buddha. This is in Japan. And we have many, 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 many photographs of crew members visiting this site. Intrepid stopped uh, in Japan on its Vietnam War deployments in the late 1960s. So I like this image because you see um, the sailors, they're wearing their blue dress uniforms, sort of walking up toward this um, this gigantic and impressive sculpture. So it's one that, you know, it's one that we see, one that we see a lot. And this Buddha, uh, the image of this Buddha appeared on a number of different types of souvenirs. So if we take a look here, um, this is my, um, one of the, this is one of my favorite souvenirs in the collection because, um, it's just a funny and sort of complicated item. And it's also interesting for us to, to store and take care of. So this is an ashtray and cigarette case that is uh, has images of this great Buddha on the item. So I this angle I'm showing you because you can really see where the lighter is embedded here, right? You can see that toward the back, with the silver sort of top. On the left side is a cigarette box. And then on the right side, is where the Buddha is lying down. And there's a hole in the Buddha's stomach, which is the ashtray portion of this. Now I will say this, you know, people bought this, this item in Japan. It's a bit of a head scratcher to me that you would want to use the Buddha as an ashtray, but you know, I'm not the souvenir producer. So <laughs> we just, we have it and we, um, and we, we take care of it. So here is an image looking straight down at, uh, at the ashtray. So again, on the left side, where there's a rectangle, that's where somebody could store their cigarettes. The silver thing toward the top is the top of the lighter. And then on the right side is the Buddha. 
So this looks like from these images, you know, one uh, item, right? Like it's all one piece, but this thing actually comes in a lot of different pieces. And so I will show you another picture of it, how it comes if you took it apart. So the lid is off, the lighter is out, the Buddha and the Buddha belly is out as well in case you want to clean it or something. And um, I love this picture. One of the things that my you know collections team does in taking care of all these wonderful things is do a lot of photo documentation of the things that we have. And anything we have that comes in pieces, we always take, um, take a lot of photos of those different pieces so that we can see all of the components of an object. Um, so that we know all the different pieces and can put them back together. So just a little fun glimpse into our sort of background of how we um, how we take care of things and how we keep track of them. But yeah, I do enjoy this. Uh, I do enjoy this ashtray. Um, it's definitely the most complicated ashtray we have in the collection, um, and probably the largest. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a fun one. So here is another picture of a different um, a different place on board. So you can take a look, maybe see some of the words here around this space. See Iberia, the television, Iberia radio. This was taken in a bullfighting arena in Barcelona. And again, just like the Great Buddha is a was a popular excursion for crew members who were on board and went to Japan. Bullfighting was a popular excursion for crew members who were on board and visited Spain. And so things and images associated with bullfighting is something that we see quite a bit of. Again, this is a, you know, a different time. I imagine there's not so much of this happening, if at all, anymore in Spain. But um, it was certainly a really big draw um, for crew members at the time. And it's a little hard to see in this image just because it's pulled back so much. But if you look down in the audience, and you see all these little white um, circles. Those are the um, the white Dixie Cup Navy hats of sailors. So the lower deck of this um, is a lot of a lot of sailors visiting this arena because it was a big, often a group um, uh, a group tour. Um, and so we, again, we have a few different things associating associated with visits to Spain. And so one of my favorites is this pair of wooden souvenir castanets that um, were brought back by a crew member um, who serves on board. This one is from I, the, this, this crew member was on board in the like late, late fifties timeframe. So um, you can see, again, we take pictures of the I, I, objects in different ways. So in one sense, the castanet, one side, the castanets are open. So you can see the inside. On the other one, you can see the exterior, which shows a matador and a, and a charging bull. And then on this other one, we can see this is another image of the outside of both of them. And you can see two different images of matadors and bulls on these castanets. So you get to see sort of both sides. They're held together with some ribbon. And then on the reverse side, which I didn't include a picture of, I think there's a hat and a cape on the other side of them, hand painted. So um, so again, this is a, this is a, a souvenir that um, this crew member brought back from Spain, which is cool. And then the, I think the last souvenir we're going to look at before we go into talking about some other kinds of things crew members were doing. Um, this is an image, I, I always find this photo really funny. Um, this is an image of the Hakone ropeway in Japan. So this would take crew member or anybody, tourists up the side of a mountain. And once you get up to the top of this place, it gives you a beautiful view of Mount Fuji. And so I, what I think is funny about this picture is that it looks like a sardine can full of sailors shoved into it because you can see them all on their white uniforms kind of pressed up against the glass, taking, um, taking their photos. This was maybe taken from maybe somebody in another one of these cars going the opposite direction, perhaps. Um, and it's a really clear and, um, and great image. So it's one of my favorite port of call photographs just because I find it funny that they're all squeezed in there. And again, this was a popular place to visit as well. And we have a number of souvenirs that crew members brought back from Hakone. And here is one of them. So this is a um, photo of a little saucer and a little teacup. And you can see painted on it is the Hakone ropeway. And the cars, I don't know if you noticed in the previous image, uh, are white on the top and red on the bottom. So you can see them painted here like that. And then on the teacup is an image of Mount Fuji. And this is an example of something we're seeing it in this way, maybe misleading how big it is, but this, this saucer is really tiny. 
it's just, you know, a couple inches across the teacup is itty bitty. This is not something that you would ever really drink tea out of. Um, it's sort of like a doll scale uh, cup and saucer. But it's very cute. You can also see, you know, these these souvenirs have been kept by crew members in their homes for a really long time. And um, and uh, and you can see some water staining and things like that on uh, on the on the cup. Um, so yeah, so that is um, so those are some souvenirs. So pretty much what I've shown you, we've got looked at some cultural things, some main sites. These are big places to go see sculptures and um, you know the Acropolis, right? These are these are some major tourist attractions. But not everybody who's visiting Ports of Call is wanting as their first thing to do is to go take in culture, of course, right? As so I was saying at the beginning, crew members are working hard. They are stuck on the ship for long periods of time. And for many of them, really, they just want to go and um, uh, have a drink. This is a picture from World War II. This is actually, this was sort of an unintentional port of call visit because Intrepid was going through the Panana Panama Canal and whacked into the side of it. And so the crew needed to stop while the, the um, repair work, uh, temporary repair work was done. So these are guys in um, Panama City. And again, port visits provided crew members with a break, but also with some things that were not available to them on um, uh, on the ship. So one thing that's one thing to note is that, um, which many people, but not everybody knows, is there's no alcohol on U.S. Navy ships. Uh, that it, um, the Navy banned the consumption of alcohol on ships in 1914. The exception to that is um, medicinal alcohol. So often the Medical officers have the ability to prescribe alcohol if somebody is shaken up, like if a pilot has a rough landing, if somebody goes overboard and gets recovered, um, you know, they may they may get a drink from the from the doctor. But generally speaking, you're not supposed to be drinking on ships. Not supposed to, of course. There are people making their own, some industrious types brewing alcohol on board Intrepid. There are people who are smuggling it on and having doing some secret drinking. But, you know, sometimes crew members, they want to go and have a legitimate drink somewhere. And so um, hitting a bar is often a you know, popular activity for these crew members when they roll into port. Oh, also, for most of Intrepid service, um, the drinking age was 21 in the U.S. I, know, I mean, now it's 21. In the past, it varied a little bit from state to state. Some states was 18. But, um, but so many crew members would not have been able to sit in a bar legally in the United States. So that was exciting to be able to go to um, go to another country and go get a drink, go get a legal drink in a bar, which is also exciting to, you know, young people today, college students today, all of that. So it remains, uh, it remains appealing. So this is one activity that you could not get on board Intrepid. Another activity that you could not get on board Intrepid um, is, oops, is women. Um, now, uh, women did not serve on Intrepid. Um, women were not on uh, Navy ships until after combat ships, until after Intrepid service. And so often um, many crew members, not all certainly, were seeking the company of whether it's bar girls, whether it's sex workers um, during their visits in port. And so this is a picture of a guy going into a bar in Hong Kong, I think. Um, and this is, a, we have numerous photos like this. This is one that's, you know, printable maybe we're not in print, but still that says something that's, you know, reasonably not too questionable, um, uh, going in and seeking out these sorts of, um, entertainments and the, the crew or the officers, particularly the medical officer tried to educate crew members about why perhaps this might not be the world's best, um, activity. And certainly the medical officer did a lot of, of work trying to, uh, um, cure people afterwards for any uh, unintentional souvenirs they may have picked up and visit, visiting places like this. But, you know, certainly this is part of the um, port visit for crew members um, uh, on board Intrepid. And I would imagine on Navy ships today pulling up into different places. Now, the Navy did not really, here, we'll switch to this one. The Navy understood that the crew is going to be letting off steam when they were going to visit different ports, of course. And, um, and this was, you know, this was a bit of a concern for the Navy. And again, remains a bit of concern for the Navy because they don't really want to be bad visitors in places, right? Loud, or rude people, 
um, who are belligerent. It just doesn't reflect well on the Navy. It doesn't reflect well on the U.S. And so people who broke rules in port were subject to, to punishment uh, when they came back on board the ship. And so the Navy established shore patrol to help maintain peace and order in these different ports. So if we take a look at this image here, the group of sailors standing on the left are members of Intrepid's shore patrol. They're all wearing their white uniforms. They're all wearing a navy blue armband, which we'll take a closer look at in a second. And essentially, um, people who were assigned to shore patrol, um, the crew members, their job was really to um, monitor the behavior of their fellow shipmates and try to stop problems before they start, right? To kind of watch, notice if anybody's getting rowdy, if people are getting into, you know, maybe getting into altercations with any locals, um, that kind of thing. And, um, and yeah, so th their job is really just to, to try to, to try to keep the peace. And we have some pictures of some more detail about some of the stuff that they were wearing. So this is an armband from the shore patrol. So this was in that photo, that Navy um, band around the upper arm of those guys has a yellow SP on it for shore patrol so that they would be very easily identifiable in port. So you could you could see them coming. And also if you needed assistance or somebody needed assistance, then you could you know ask the shore patrol. Um, another thing was a baton uh, that they were issued as part of their shore patrol um, uh, get up so that they could, you know, if they needed to um, break up fights, they had an implement to do so. And typically what would happen um, if you got into trouble in port, um, often what would happen is that uh, you would come back, well, if word got back right to the ship, um, if the shore patrol reported you or something like that, you would have to stand captain's mast, which is essentially a, um, you go to the commanding officer and um, they weigh the evidence about, you know, the commanding officer weighs the evidence about what you did. So say the shore patrol witnesses you getting into a fight with a local, or you're being loud and disorderly, this all gets reported to the commanding officer and you get punished in some form or another. And that could include things like extra duty. Um, it could be things like you might get a reduction in your rate. So meaning a reduction in your pay grade, you could have to pay a fine, you could lose liberty in the future. Um, if the issue is really problematic, you could end up spending some time in the ship's brig which is essentially the, the jail on board for a number of days, which often meant being confined to a small cell, kind of eating bread and water or the equivalent, and also doing extra work during your time there. So, um, so they, the the Navy really, the Navy understood that crew members were going to carouse a bit, but also it was really important for them to not take it too far. Um, so, you know, so there are con there are consequences to your to your wild times. Uh, wild times on liberty and again like the crew members are a vastly diverse group and people had different things that they wanted to do so certainly not everybody was off running around and drinking other people were doing other things um and you know just part of uh part of the whole liberty experience and yeah here's um where i'm almost through all of my images i have one more but um the experience of traveling in foreign ports was often really transformative for the crew of Intrepid. Um, this guy is sitting um, on an overlook of the city of Florence in Italy. Um, and this particular crew member, his name is William Young, um, has donated to us many postcards, and photographs, I've used some of them uh, in the presentation today, that really capture what it was like for these crew members just to see these amazing sites, to, um, to have this level of freedom to really kind of wander around in these places and just explore. It really meant a lot to many crew members. Many crew members, you know, really, again, they joined the Navy for this reason. Not everybody, but many people. And they really felt that being on Intrepid, especially people who were on Intrepid in the 50s and 60s, that it really lived up to their expectations. And, you know, one of the things that I get to do, one of the great pleasures of my job at the museum is that I get to interview a lot of crew members and many of them have very fond, often very funny um, memories of their time visiting all these different, um, all these different places. 
um, which is very cool. And some of them continued on. They say that their that being in the Navy gave them a love of travel that they had that they stays with them to this day, which is great. So I mentioned I mentioned a couple times we have so many things associated with this topic. We had actually done an exhibit about ports of call on board the ship a few years ago, and it just scratched the surface of the things that we have. You know, we're working to get more of our collections online to share more of these things. Um, and so there is one, I would say probably the best way if any of you want to learn more about ports of call on Intrepid um, and by extension sort of the Navy during this period, we have um, a uh, page up on Google Arts and Culture, which is a really Google Arts and Culture is a collection of different organizations that have aspects of their collection available online. At the bottom, I put down our specific URL for um, our partner page, which is Intrepid Sea Air and Space Museum. Although certainly it's on Google. You can Google Google Arts and Culture Intrepid Museum and find our page. And um, one of the exhibits that we have up there is called On Liberty at War, Intrepid's Ports of Call During the Vietnam War. So it covers some of the same material that I um, that I just talked about. Um, but there are some other things on here as well I think are particularly interesting if you have time and want to check it out. So there's an opportunity to look more closely at some of the documents I shared. So if you want to read about things like, you know, some of those um, uh, plans of the day with the blood drive. Also, I think we have up there a list of some of the punishments that people got from their liberty infractions um, and some other like ports of call booklets to actually look at some of those materials. It's a good place to check it out. There's also at the end of it, um, a, um, a compilation of clips from our oral history collection of crew members talking about their experiences in port. And it goes through the whole range, you know, people who want to go see the sites, so people who talk about their love of architecture and how they really got to enjoy that in the Navy, people talking about, you know, hitting the bars and that sort of thing. There's also some interesting discussion about um, race and the, what black crew members experienced when they were visiting ports of call in other parts of the world. Um, also in some areas where there was some segregation uh, in the bars where crew members would go. So there's a lot more in there if you wanna hear from crew members directly about their time on board Intrepid and visiting visiting ports. Um, so here we'll actually, we'll get rid of that because that's all the images. Um, so um, thank you very much. I'm trying to see, I don't know, I've saw different people chiming in. I'm glad people appreciated this. I see, I see Barb Simple out there, thanks Barb. Um, and you know we're doing these streams pretty frequently. We're looking for different things in the collection to talk about. So you know maybe in the future we'll get to show different parts of the ship, which is always fun. So I you know appreciate everybody coming and joining us today. Check out our other um, other programming. And oops, sorry, I'm like uh, losing uh, losing my screen here. Um, yeah, so we hope you check out our other um, programming and, you know, we appreciate any donations pe from people to help us keep all of this wonderful programming free and available to all of you. Um, so check that out. Also check out membership um, if you're interested. There's a lot of different options for that, even in the current pandemic mode here. But um, thank you again for watching and I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Take care.